How's it going, everybody? <laughs> All right, that's quite the start. That's quite the start. All right, how's it going, everybody? Thank you so much for coming out tonight. In Dearborn, Michigan, this is great. It's good to be here. You know, CNN, we actually have CNN in the, in the building with us tonight. They're filming some propaganda documentary, which, <laughs> which is very interesting. But CNN, you know, and all these news outlets, they told me that uh, Dearborn was this city filled with terrorists and people chanting, people who chant death to America and stuff. And uh, I don't know, I haven't seen that. I had some great Yemeni food. I had some great Yemeni coffee and uh, met a lot of amazing people. And uh, I just thank you so much for welcoming all of us here with such uh, open arms. So thank you again. Um, you know, today's event is called uh, Free America to Free Palestine. And I think this is what distinguishes our movement, the Institute for Free America, which we are officially launching tonight. It's a political think tank, and we've got a lot of really exciting stuff that's going to be coming soon with this. But I think this is what distinguishes us from so many of the other Palestinian organizations that are advocating for the rights of Palestinians. Not to, uh, not to attack anyone or condemn anyone, but simply, I think a critique needs to be made uh, to understand what we have to do as Americans, because simply posting the atrocities in Gaza is not going to actually bring what's happening to an end. Talking about this stuff on YouTube shows or on Twitter, it's good to you know, share the information, but it's not going to bring any of this to an end. What we have to do as Americans is embrace our patriotic duty to actually challenge those in the warmongering deep state about the actions and the crimes that they're committing. So, without further ado, my, uh, my speech today is about the consequences of complicity. And complicity, of course, in this genocide, but also complicity in all of the wars, regime change uh, efforts, foreign influence operations, and uh, you know, uh, CIA-backed coups that we have embarked upon long before I was here on this earth. So, I love this picture, by the way. Shout out to, uh, shout out to the AI gods for giving me this beautiful shot of the American cowboys with the Palestine flag. For starters, we have to ask, what, what is in the interests of Americans here? It's a very diverse country, so what as Americans should we be pursuing in this country? And I think it's very simple. At a fundamental level, what, what is in the interest of Americans? It's economic prosperity for the people. It's to have a developed nation with good infrastructure and clean cities, a government that answers to the demands of the people, a powerful nation amongst nations that pursues win-win cooperation uh, and friendly relations with the rest of the world, and a nation that is self-sufficient and safe. Now, obviously, none of those things are guaranteed to us as Americans yet, but those are things that we should be striving for. As you can see already, and you know, you're, you, you being here is a testament to this fact, more and more Americans are waking up to the fact that what our government is doing in Gaza is an atrocity, it is a genocide, okay? Looking at this, uh, at this poll, this was a Gallup poll, I believe, from November of 2023 to March of 2024, there has been a massive upheaval in the level of public disapproval for what Genocide Joe is commanding the IDF terrorists to do inside of Gaza. It's not just Democrats, and it's not just independent voters. It's also actually, to a lesser extent, but still Republicans as well, who are increasingly uh, disapproving what Genocide Joe is doing. And when you look at the stats amongst young Americans, I see many of you in the crowd here tonight, uh, the, the numbers become all the more clear. As you can see here, in the middle bar, uh, I think this is the most interesting stat, you have Republican voters, and you have Republican voters in the, in the second bar, ages 18 to 29. You have only 28% of Republican voters in the age bracket of 18 to 29 who stand with the Israeli people. That's a huge deal. Fox News has got a big uh, issue on their hands, I think. 
Now, we know that the government doesn't represent our interest. That is uh, quite clear, as we've said. These polls are proof of that. Our government is captured by these mega corporations, the military industrial complex. It's captured by Big Pharma, who pushed all of these, you know, these drugs on Americans over the past several years when responding to the COVID pandemic. It's controlled by big tech. It's controlled by Wall Street, the city of London, and of course, foreign lobby groups. Foreign lobby groups that great leaders of this nation like John F. Kennedy and Robert F. Kennedy tried to outlaw or categorize as foreign agents. Somehow or another, they ended up dead. I'm not sure who could have done that. The argument we must focus on as Americans who are still uh, want to see this country succeed, don't want to burn everything down, is we must address those Americans who are still pr propagandized by the mainstream media, like our good friends at CNN here tonight, those who are buying the Israeli propaganda still, after eight months of genocide, 40,000 killed, probably a lot higher than that. We don't have the real stats because most of those children are still trapped under rubble. Uh, we, we have to address those Americans. And the fact of the matter is, if eight months of photos and videos of genocide didn't convince them already, we do have to try a, a different approach. That approach is one that I aim to embark upon here tonight. That being that our relationship with Israel is actually not in the interests of America or Americans. You know, you'll talk to these neoconservatives and they'll say, well, Jackson, you know, you're young. You, this, the genocide, sure, it's bad, but Israel is our strategic ally. We have to protect them. I don't think so. I think it would be much better if we let Israel disintegrate and, you know, it would be a state no more. Some people will say, uh, well, Jackson, you know, maybe, maybe you're like a college anarchist and you might look at me and you say, but Jackson, we should just burn the whole country down. I don't like anything that America does. Well, those people are also misguided because the fact of the matter is, you know, I'm a communist, you might not be, but the truth is we as communists or we as American patriots must rep the American flag. <laughs> We have to rep the American flag. We have to embody what it means to be an American. And the thing that we cannot do is allow those, those warmongering genocidal pricks in Washington, D.C. to hijack the flag, to hijack what it means to be an American. Because slaughtering innocent ethnic Russians in the Donbass, you know, that's not something that any of our founding fathers envisioned. In fact, you know, it was Russia that supported the 1776 revolution against Britain. Uh, genociding innocent people in Gaza also, I'm sure, was not on the agenda for uh, those like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. And if you don't believe me about the importance of actually embodying and embracing this American patriotic vision about caring for your neighbor, caring for your countrymen, making sure that you do show that respect to the country, the land, the people, the soil that provided you with everything you have today, Take a look at this. This is a quote from Vladimir Lenin, who was waging a revolution at the time against uh, monarchical evil that wanted to use the Russian people as cannon fodder in for-profit capitalist wars, uh, rather than actually embrace the tradition of the Russian people and fight for a better future for Russia. Lenin at the time, he wasn't one of these people that said, you know, screw everything about Russia, let's burn it all down. No, what he said was, we are full of a sense of national pride. And for that very reason, we particularly hate our slavish past and our slavish present. Where these self-same landed proprietors, aided by the capitalists, are loading us into a war. Such a war only strengthens the gang of Romanovs and Bobrinskys, who are disgraced to our great Russian national dignity. Now, I think we all have a lot to learn from that very quote, because at the same time that we hate our government, we hate what they're doing, we hate that they're sending Americans to go bomb innocent people all across the world, we do have a duty to actually fix this country, pick up the pieces, and make something beautiful once more, okay? Now, there's four main points I want to address regarding why 
our relationship with Israel is not in the best interest of America, the American people, or our economy, or even our military. The first is our relationship with Israel means that we are, by default, neglecting the homeland. Let's take a look at America today. Each year, 74,000 overdose deaths, 600,000 cancer-related deaths, 702,000 heart disease deaths, 80 million people lack basic health insurance right now here today. 100 million Americans have medical debt. We have 500,000 homeless Americans and they're sending bombs to Israel, Patriot battery systems to Ukraine. 60,000 of those homeless are veterans. It's insane. 20% of Americans are facing mental health issues and 65% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. I don't know about you guys, but that is about as clear of an indication as I could ever uh, think of to show that we are an empire in decline and we are living in a failed state. For all the finger pointing that we get from global leaders uh, in the West saying, you know, Russia's a failed state, China's a failed state, Iran is a failed state, you know, they say all this crazy stuff. It's like, well, hold up, I've been to Russia, I've been to China. Their major cities are much nicer, much cleaner, much safer, have no homeless, they have better infrastructure. And I'm not saying I want to move to Russia or China, I'm an American. But the fact of the matter is, we got a lot to learn from these countries, and we shouldn't just be saying, you know, that making up lies and saying that they're failed states, because that's simply not true. And let's talk about their economies, okay? Because Russia and China are not waging imperialist for-profit wars. They're not, it's just a fact. Uh, let's look at Russia and China. Despite sanctions, Russia is now the G20's fifth fastest growing economy. Russia is the largest economy in Europe. The UK, however, in Germany, they're in a recession. Russia's economy has just reached a 10-year high. This is coming after two years when Joe Biden said, you know, oh, we're going to sanction Russia into oblivion. They're going to be on their hands and knees begging for us to drop those sanctions. It's like, no, Russia's better and stronger than ever before, and their leader has a very high approval rating. Uh, on the left, you see me in uh, Shanghai. I know it looks like I, I photoshopped myself in front of a Blade Runner or something, or like some crazy futuristic movie, but that's, that's actually a real city in China, and there's many cities in China that look like this. In fact, I don't even think Shanghai is the most beautiful, but as for China, they also are destroying us economically. China's economy will grow by 5.3% this year. The American economy will grow by 1%. China's hunger rate is 2.5%, just like the United States is. But China's hunger rate decreased 7% since 2001. The United States was stagnant. In 2022, China surpassed the US in GDP purchasing power parity by $5 trillion. Could you imagine? Everyone talks and everyone thinks that the United States is the world's largest economy. What do we produce? Uber Eats? Lyft rides? Like, we don't actually build anything here. We have rapacious, uh, you know, for-profit systems of middlemen. We have rent. We have, uh, you know, a class of people who benefit from the, you know, debt structure in this country. It is a Byzantine labyrinth of nothing but, as Matthew McConaughey said in The Wolf of Wall Street, fugazi, fugazi. One last point here. Chinese salaries have increased two times over the last decade. U.S. salaries were, of course, stagnant. So all of this is to simply say that why, why are we neglecting our homeland? Why aren't we advancing at the same rate, at least, of Russia and China? We call these countries gas stations with nuclear bombs, but their gas stations seem to be doing very well, very good business. Uh, the truth is that true power comes to those who put death before dishonor those who respond to the needs of their people, those who take care of their citizens, like a loving father takes care of his children, and ultimately those who choose to build common prosperity rather than hegemonic control. Those who don't will suffer the consequences and the United States already is. Now this photo right here, uh, it drew a lot of controversy when I posted it on Twitter. 
but I actually love this photo. You know, you got the founding fathers, you got some revolutionaries with Hamas. And I will just say once and for all, so Pierce Morgan never has to ask me again, no, I do not condemn Hamas. Very simple. Well, look, it, it is fundamentally un-American to support Israel. You go to Israel today, what's in the news? Haaretz, Israeli media, spike in incidents of Jewish people in Israel spitting on Christian worshipers in Jerusalem. As a Christian, that doesn't sound like any country I want to visit, although I don't think that Mossad would let me even if I wanted to. Uh, if you go to Israel today, you'll witness... Uh, the IDF firing off bombs at some of the oldest Orthodox Christian churches, not just in Gaza, but in the world. That Christian church that they bombed several months ago, that was the third oldest Christian church in the world. I saw a new stat this week, very shocking. Israel, since October 7th, has murdered 3% of the entire Christian population of Gaza. It's shame indeed, shame indeed. Not to mention our uh, blind loyalty for our great ally of Ukraine, right? The great democracy of Ukraine, which at this very moment is imprisoning uh, Russian Orthodox clerics, uh, Christian leaders all throughout the country. They are bombing Russian Orthodox churches in the Donbass. And uh, they, they do not seem intent on stopping. No one in the U.S. Embassy in Kiev seems uh, hellbent on stopping what they're doing to Christians inside of Ukraine. So the question again, just why is it that we, America, a country that was founded at least to some extent on these sorts of ideals and the ideals that everyone is allowed to worship freely, free of prosecution, or persecution, we're supporting countries that are spitting on Christians, bombing Christians, doing all this crazy stuff, not to mention what we're doing to all other religious groups around the world, but specifically, I think for those sorts of Fox News viewers who might still be supporting Israel, this argument might land home with a lot of them. I guess we'll have to wait and see. Um, so yes, this is, uh, this is just another really base photo. I thought, <laughs> I, thought, I thought it'd be good to put these photos next to each other, you know. Oh, the terrorists throwing little pebbles at the IDF, you know, $4 million Merkava tanks. How could they? All right. All right. Now, the, the third point, uh, isolation on the global stage. Ra raise your hand if you've ever heard of uh, BRICS. Oh, my people. I love it. I saw even our CNN journalist raise his hand. That's great. <laughs> A little shocked, but that's great. I'll stop picking on you. I'll stop. We're now living in the era of multipolarity, and uh, it just puts a smile on my face. I love it because what this means is that the unipolar order of the United States controlling everything across the world is in its, it, it's in its last steps. You know, there, there's not much left to it. The days of the United States telling any country around the world how they are to act, what religions they're allowed to follow, uh, what they're allowed to do with their military, if they're allowed to have a military, what they're allowed to do economically, what they're, who they're allowed to trade with, what currencies they're allowed to use. This is all how the system of unipolarity has been able to maintain itself for years and years and years. But right now we're witnessing something really incredible happen. Russia and China at the helm of this uh, economic unit called BRICS is challenging the United States and the West, not just economically, but also militarily and culturally. The foundation of BRICS, of course, is made up of Russia and China, as well as India, Brazil, South Africa, Iran, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Egypt, and Ethiopia. Argentina was also brought in, but their Zionist dipshit, sorry for my French, leader, Javier Malay, the guy that's, you know, he got elected and then he went directly, he left Argentina and went to go kiss the wall with Benjamin Netanyahu, he pulled out of BRICS. I wonder why. Now, this October, there's going to be some new BRICS members that are brought into the fold. Bolivia, Syria, Zimbabwe, Cuba, and Cameroon are all expected to join the BRICS grouping. The more that we support Israel, the more that 
the multipolar world is going to take shape in a very quick manner. And it's still shocking to me that those in D.C. have not figured this out yet. But the more money we send to Ukraine, Ukrainian Nazis, by the way, the more bombs we send to Israel, the more javelins we send to Taiwan, Taiwanese separatist terrorists, the more that the multipolar world is going to take shape quicker and quicker. Okay? Now, what does unipolarity mean for Gaza? What it means is it, uh, it's, it's the force that bans any nation from doing trade or having relations with terrorist groups, okay? You know, those, those pesky terrorist groups that are fighting for their freedom. It criminalizes opposition to the state of Israel. It maintains the sanction-induced famine on Gaza, vetoes a ceasefire in Gaza at the United Nations, vetoes Palestinian statehood at the United Nations, threatens to sanction the ICC for issuing arrest warrants against Netanyahu, bribes countries from filing genocide lawsuits at the International Court of Justice, and prevents any nation from standing up for themselves economically, culturally, or militarily. BRICS already has six of the top ten oil-producing countries in the world, and three of the top five. Now, that's a big problem for the United States, who bases all of our power on the power of the petrodollar. When you begin to have all these countries like Saudi Arabia going rogue and joining BRICS with Putin and dabbing them up when they meet in Moscow, you're going to have some problems. BRICS has already called on Middle Eastern countries to stop using the U.S. dollar for oil trade settlements. BRICS members account for 52% of all global oil production. BRICS is also winning over historic allies of the United States, as I mentioned, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, uh, the UAE, who all have long-standing deep ties with the United States. So each of these BRICS members, they're focusing on their development. They're getting non-predatory loans from the BRICS New Development Bank. They're allowed to uh, conduct relations with whoever they want, and they're allowed to support groups like Hamas and Hezbollah and the PFLP and the DFLP, and they're allowed to work with Iran. Iran just did a huge trade deal with China, huge energy deal. Uh, they did a huge port deal with India. You know, so there's some crazy people who say like, oh, you know, I'm going to celebrate the death of President Raisi, but I support Palestine. What? Shame on those people. Shame on those people. And also, if they don't know what they're saying, I hope they pick up a book. Because the fact of the matter is, Iran, much through the participation in this new multipolar world, with the economic success they've achieved, with the military assets that they have been given and that they have helped create even for the Russian military, they were able to, over the course of several years, plan the October 7th attacks. That is who is behind the October 7th attacks. Of course, with the leadership of the Palestinian resistance, but Iran played a very large role, and Iranian media has recently come out and admitted that. Uh, they also are the ones who are providing Hamas with a lot of the blueprints for Russian weapons that they're creating in Gaza. China, just recently, about two months ago, began providing new Chinese sniper rifles to Hamas fighters so they could share all those amazing Red Triangle videos with us on a daily basis. The point is, the more America supports real terrorist entities like Israel, real terrorist countries like Ukraine, the more that we strengthen our actual enemies like Iran. I don't think Iran should be our enemy, but that's what is going to happen. And the more that we're going to turn off our allies, like France and Spain, who just said they're going to recognize a Palestinian state, and they're now talking about, yes. I never thought I'd mention uh, Macron or Olaf Scholz and receive a round of applause for what they're doing, but... You know, they're talking about if Netanyahu sets foot in their countries, they'll be arrested. I mean, this is, this is crazy stuff, and this is what happens when we have blind loyalty to any one country. It doesn't matter if it is Israel today and Iran tomorrow. We have to do what is in the best interests of the American people, and today that's not supporting Israel. The more that we do this, we limit our influence on global resource markets. That's why I mention everything regarding BRICS's uh, you know, capture of the oil markets and the gas markets, and soon with Bolivia, lithium markets worldwide. 
Uh, the more we do this, we shrink our base of power and debase our standing on the international stage. You don't have to be a brainiac to see what's happening with the United Nations General Assembly. We are some of the few and far between uh, you know, uh, individuals that are represented by a country that is not voting for Palestinian statehood. And lastly, we advance the decline in the standard of living for Americans the more that our government does this. What's going on in Israel, it is a costly suicide mission. We are sending billions to diaper forces. There is no reason for any of this. Like, look, you know, October 7th came around. I've seen all the videos. I, I've met IDF soldiers. You know, these kids, are, these kids are at the University of Southern California. They go on their, uh, what's the thing called where you get to go to? But they go on their birthright. They come back. They're in, you know, Sigma Chi fraternity, and they're talking to some, you know, uh, sorority girls. And they're like, yeah, I'm in the IDF, bro. I mean, isn't that cool? Well, it's cool until uh, Hamas decides to do an October 7th, right? And then, then you got to go back to Tel Aviv. So anyways, to make this very simple, uh, Israel has been unable to provide strategic goals for what they're doing in Gaza. We all know that. This is a long tradition of American warmongers. You know, it's like, let's go to Iraq. Let's go to Syria. Do we have a goal? No. Okay, but let's go anyways, right? They, they've put out a few ideas, though. Wipe out Hamas. How's that gone? Not very good. Not very good. According to U.S. intelligence estimates that I saw yesterday, so these are up to date, Israel has wiped out 30% of Hamas fighters. So to translate that for all of you in non-propaganda talk, that means Israel has wiped out about 5% of Hamas fighters. <laughs> you know, they always, uh, they always inflate their statistics. Uh, the, the truth of the matter is virtually no senior leaders of Hamas have been killed. The New York Times is now writing that we have to kill Sinwar or else we can't end this operation in Gaza. Maybe they will, but if you haven't found him after eight months, I can't imagine that you'll have better luck moving forward, but maybe they will. Uh, they, you know, they haven't found any of these much talked about Hamas tunnels. We haven't seen that. We saw them find, uh, well, they did say they found two tunnels. One of them was like a, a water pipe system, and the other was an elevator shaft, both near hospitals that they blew up. Uh, they did get very close on the tracks of Hamas one time, and they put out this uh, very interesting video with a calendar uh, that claimed to show the names of all the Hamas fighters that had been working in that very hospital. But, uh, you know, I didn't know this. I don't speak Arabic, so, you know, maybe... I don't know, I wouldn't look at a calendar and immediately think those are the names of terrorists. I'd think those are the days of the week, and that's exactly what it was. Now, as for uh, another thing they put forward, they said, oh, we're going to win victory in battle. It's a very vague term. Have they won victory in battle? Well, no, they've lost to Hamas. Thousands of Israeli soldiers are dead. Thousands more are going back to Tel Aviv after stints in IDF hospitals with missing limbs and serious injuries. So that's not that surprising. But it is surprising that Israel's still going because they are a very casualty-phobic military. Usually they stop any operation after 2,000 individuals are killed. They have not done that. Uh, what about uh, the other forces? Because it's not just Palestine. Well, Hezbollah has neutralized a whole lot of Israeli military assets in the north of, yeah. Shout out Nasrallah. The glorious Nasrallah has uh, taken out a lot of these Israeli military assets in the north of Israel and military experts, even those in the west, uh, they, they have, uh, they've guesstimated that if a full war breaks out between Hezbollah and Israel, it will end with Hezbollah occupying, or as I say, liberating several towns in the north of Israel. Uh, Did they win victory with Iran? Well, if you watch uh, the mainstream media, you might think so, but the fact of the matter is, what Iran did was unprecedented. They launched hundreds of missiles into Israeli territory in a joint operation with several other countries. Uh, but the hundreds that they launched were mostly decoys. They were low-tech missiles. They only launched seven high-tech missiles at Israel, and that whole uh, you know, fleet uh, uh, of drones and, and bombs that they sent. 
And where were those seven missiles targeted at? They were targeted at the Nevitim Air Base, which is said to be the most secure air base in the entire world. Uh, what ended up happening on that glorious day was five out of the seven missiles that Iran launched at Nevitim Air Base, the most secure air base in the world, hit their targets. Now, Uh, the, the, Iran didn't want a full war at that moment. They were simply sending a message, but this, you know, was a, it, it was a watershed moment because it showed the world: a, Israel's not impenetrable; uh, b, their 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 Iron Dome is is uh, useless as used toilet paper. And ultimately, if a war does break out with Iran, uh, Israel will no longer exist. And that's not just due to the fact that Iran has superior military capabilities with their factions in the region. Uh, it also has to do with the fact that millions of people have already left Israel because of the instability in the country and around them, and millions more would definitely leave if uh, it came to full-out war. Has Israel freed the hostages? This, this one really gets me. They, they thought the guy on the right in this photo with the red hair was a Hamas fighter. So they killed him. These are three hostages that Israel killed when they came screaming and running out of, uh, out of uh, you know, a Hamas bunker somewhere, and they were saying, help us, help us. They were waving a white flag, and Israel killed them. Brilliant military, killing their own hostages. Uh, in addition to that, Netanyahu has already said that we're not going to free all the hostages. He told that to the families of the hostages and they were very upset by that. In addition to that, we've also seen Israel kill many of their own hostages in airstrikes and bombings. So, uh, you know, the IDF, it's a, it's a terrific military. They're really getting the job done of freeing those hostages. What about Palestinian statehood? Because this is another goal of Israel, to prevent Palestinian statehood. Well, we know that's not going well. 143 countries just voted to support Palestinian statehood at the General Assembly. And only nine nations voted against this at the General Assembly. There are almost as many countries now worldwide uh, who only recognize Palestinian statehood and don't recognize Israeli statehood as the number of countries who only recognize Israeli statehood and don't recognize Palestinian statehood. We've lost many of our allies to this fight to prevent Palestinian statehood. Most recently, we lost France, Spain, Norway, Ireland, Bahamas, Jamaica, Barbados, Japan, and South Korea uh, to the fight to prevent a Palestinian state. So that's not going well. Uh, what about the domestic political situation inside of Israel? Well, thousands each and every day are joining anti-government protests. They're calling for snap elections. They're even suing the government of Israel to try and uh, bring about justice for those who have been killed by Israel as they're being held hostage inside of Gaza. And lastly, last point here, my favorite slide. <laughs> Israel wants to gain sympathy on the global stage. Have they achieved that? Has the United States helped them achieve that? The answer, of course, is no. Uh, Israel has seen a startling uh, departure from decades upon decades of subservient politics from West, the West and Western institutions. We saw the International Criminal Court issue arrest warrants for Netanyahu and other senior genocidal leaders inside of Israel. Absolutely incredible. And uh, again, countries are actually saying they're going to uphold these. So if Netanyahu goes to Germany, he will be arrested. We've seen the International Court of Justice uh, you know, embark upon this genocide lawsuit. Now, there was some sort of an update this morning. I was getting ready for this event, but... Uh, maybe some of you can inform me as to what happened after the show, because I heard there was potentially some good news there. We've seen Western states, including our allies, begin sanctioning Zionist settler groups who are actually blocking aid from entering Gaza. And uh, lastly, we've seen more nations than ever before endorsing Palestinian statehood and working to establish a Palestinian Governments like Russia and China who are taking active meetings with Hamas 
and other groups inside of Gaza to prepare for the post-war government. And uh, one last point here, Yemen. Shout out to the Ansar Allah in Yemen. The bravest, some of the bravest people in this whole story, Yemen, they have uh, nothing to lose and they understand that they are actually living by the code of putting death before dishonor because they, they fear God, unlike those in Saudi Arabia, unlike those in the UAE uh, who choose profits <laughs> over honor. Yemen has blocked global trade for Israel, the United States, and all of its allies to uh, Haifa and all the other important Israeli ports. They have cost the Israeli economy billions and billions of dollars. And they've also costed Western partners billions and billions of dollars because now they have to travel around Africa. Guess who still gets to go through the Red Sea? Russia and China. They get to go through that port because they support Gaza. Very simple, very simple. So to, to bring it home, what does America need to do? Well, we need to stop supporting you know, these genocidal maniacs. We need to get some rational people in our government, and we need to, of course, arrest everyone who is committing these crimes at this very moment, which is almost all of Congress and the White House. We need to stop interfering in governments all across the world. And if you think it's just Gaza and Russia, you know, you got a lot to learn. There's a lot more than that. We need fair and open business with the developing world. And that's very important. Uh, we, can't tr we can't act like, uh, you know, pariahs to the entire world. We need to have the prioritization of diplomacy and a strict adherence to the United Nations Charter, which is something Vladimir Putin said in 2007 uh, when speaking before a lot of these Western leaders, they chose not to listen to him, and now they've lost 500,000 men and, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars in a Ukraine proxy war. So, uh, you know, overall, that's my speech, and thank you for coming out. This is Institute for Free America. Thank you so much for coming out, everybody. You're all awesome. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Look, I don't I don't deserve any of that. Who deserves it is Hamas, Iran, Ansar Allah, and all these countries. So shout out to them.